have all seen this. It's a Waymo, uh, also known as Google, autonomous car. It has a bunch of technology around it, on top of it and around it. Uh, you may have seen also this one. This is a reactor autonomous ferry concept. We launched it at Slush last year, late last year. It also has a bunch of technology, not, not nearly as much as the Waymo car, but it does have the, basically the same elements as the car. It has the sensors, it has the AI, it has ability to move, and it, it has ability to make decisions about the movement. These two things are way different in size and in functionality, but the end of, at the end of the day, they both use pretty much the same sensor, sensors and same technology. Yeah. You have probably also heard about the Uber uh, accident or incident, what you want to call it, a couple of weeks back. It was probably the first known death of a person by autonomous car. A Uber car hit a lady at Arizona, United States, causing her death. And, and uh, there's been quite a lot of discussion around aut autonomous cars after that, the security and safety of them. One interesting topic I found was that Uber reduced the LiDAR sensors of their car from seven to one. So you can understand if you have seven things looking around and then you cut six out, you'll end up with, well, probably less uh, capable car. So why did Uber do this? Well, pretty much because sensors are expensive and the more you have sensors, the more you need computing power. So if you could run the car with only one sensor, it would be way much easier and cheaper. But unfortunately, it may have caused a death of, of a person in the United States. So th at least this headline goes around the sensors. So what, what are the sensors of autonomous vehicles and ferries and stuff? Let's go and list them a few. Before that, we might want to have a look of an architecture of autonomous car or any other vessel. This is just one way of drawing it. You, there's probably a ton of different ways of drawing the stuff. But at the very low left corner, we see the sensors. They are the eyes of the car. But in addition to that, the car knows the rules, how to drive on the road. It has navigation. The car is basically going somewhere. It needs to know where to take turns, when to go straight ahead. Uh, it needs to know the one, one direction roads, everything like that. And then at the very right corner, we have V2X, meaning vehicle to anything, communications. The car doesn't only look around, it, it also sends bits and receives bits. It asks things from around, it asks some questions from the cars in front or behind, or maybe it can receive messages from far away distances. So the sensors are definitely not the only thing the car is using to see the world. There's other things too it needs to drive the car. Uh, then we have perception. Basically, we take the raw signal from the sensors. We do some decisions based on that. And when we combine all this at the planning level, where we have the actual artificial intelligence, the neural work networks doing the magic of decisions. And at the end of the day, we need the very simple servo motors. We need all the gadgets that actually make the wheels turn may do the steering and stuff like that. Today, uh, at this talk, I'm discussing only about the sensors, but definitely sensors are not everything of autonomous vehicle. So let's begin with laser scanners. This was the topic the Uber news mentioned. Uh, at the picture, we have Vel Velodyne uh, scanner. It's very small. It's actually just a half of the size of the can. Uh, small usually equals uh, relatively low uh, resolution and relatively short mapping distances. But it's enough for this, this particular car. Uh, laser scanners basically emit a laser and then they receive it and do from that uh, traveling time, they do the math, they calculate the distance to that one particular point. And then we, when they rotate fast and do many layers at the same time, they basically build a 3D map of surrounding of the car. 
It's really good in clear weather. It sees day and night, but it doesn't see through any sort of water. So if there's raining, uh, if there's snowing, if there's um, any, any, <laughs> any sort of water in the air, it doesn't work very well. So that's the drawback. It's also quite expensive uh, uh, because it has, well, the lasers, it has the optics, it has, has the, the motors or the engines rotating, and it's, it's also, uh, it needs to be done in a very sharp way, and it, it needs to, it's very, like, hard work to make it actually, well, working. So it's, it's expensive. Also, the sensor image is relatively hard to evaluate. It's, it's, it's a cloud of dots, so you need quite a good computing power and algorithm to actually create anything meaningful out of that dot space. Then we have the radars. The radars are very well known. They work both on radio frequencies and also the ultra ultrasound frequencies. The ultrasound radar is basically the parking, parking assistant. When you park your car, there's a beeping sound telling you how far you are from the car next to you. So that's basically the ultrasound radar. The radars are lower cost. They have no moving parts, so they are rather simple. They are, they are more durable. They work day and night. They don't care about the weather. They work, the radio, radio radars work through the water, through the rain, and ultrasound is very cheap. So it, it doesn't really make any cost more to the car to add 10 of them around the car. And they are also very, like, they've been around for years, so for decades, so we know how they work. We know the performance and we know the algorithms, where algorithms very well. The problem with radars is the low resolution. Basically, the radar, it's almost like saying there is something or there isn't something. It can't, it's very bad in making decisions what the target is. The Volkswagen has told that their radars are now capable of making a difference between a car and something smaller. Something smaller can be something like a, a pedestrian or a bike, a cyclist or, or something like that. That's pretty much the, the resolution they can do. And they make it blinded. So if you have a radar here, you have radar there, if they happen to work on the same frequencies, they may blind each other. So that's also an issue. Uh, cameras, uh, the visual, well, 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 let's turn back. This black box over here, it's about the size of a matchbox, maybe, maybe a bit bigger. It's a near field radar. Uh, it works only to maybe five or 10 meters. So it basically does, it's a radio frequency radar. It does the same thing as the ultrasound radar would do. But the reason why the manufacturer chose to use radio frequencies is simply that it's weatherproof. If you have water, which gets frozen on the radar, it doesn't care if, as long as it works on a radio frequencies. But if it would be an ultrasound, it probably wouldn't work very well after that, with the ice covering the sensor. Anybody who has tried parking a car in freezing conditions has, has, said, has noticed this, that it, they don't always work like very well. Then we have cameras. This is, well, camera, everybody knows what a camera is. Depending on a camera, they may be really low cost or maybe a bit costier, depending on the optics and the performance of the camera. This small, this is a really, really small camera. It's from BMW 530e. It's about the size of, it's a bit bigger than a camera of a mobile phone. So it's really, really small. Uh, it works very well in, in daylight conditions, relatively, relatively well in good artificial lightning. But of course, it doesn't work at all in, in pure pitch darkness. So the basic problem with cameras is it's, they don't work in the dark. Uh, they also make it blinded, obviously. They don't see through rain, fog, or anything like that. But uh, in, in another hand, the cameras are actually the only sensor we have currently for the vehicles which are able to see like 200, 300 meters plus. So the radars work to somewhere around 100 meters, maybe, nowadays. Lasers to somewhere around 200 meters. And cameras, in good weather, of course, they can see for kilometers or something. Thermal camera is a special case of normal camera, of course. You can see not the visual light, but the thermal, uh, uh, thermal emit emission of, well, any, anything. It's 
thermal cameras used to be very expensive, and they still are, but it's still cheaper than laser scanners or anything like that. They work day, day and night, they don't care about the, of the visual lightning, and they are really good in, in finding like living objects, like humans, animals, anything like that. Traditional cars and any other cars are also very visible because they are warm, usually, compared to the background, at, at least in Finland, usually, at, at least in, in wintertime. Rain, fog, all the, all the water in the sky are hard to cope with. That's, that's the problem. And also, they quite often tend to have low resolution and low view of angle. Like, so you can make some small area visible, but not probably not too wide angles with them. Uh, one type of sensors, which I might have dropped off, but I still chose to add here, is the satellite positioning systems and inertia sensors. This uh, orange box is also about the size of a matchbox. Uh, it, uh <coughs> it's an inertial sensor. It basically senses the movement. When the car rotates, like turns, or accelerates, or breaks down, it, it can sense that and do some math around it. It's not very well visible, but this black uh, thing behind here is a GPS antenna. So that's the normal GPS global positioning system we all have in our mo mobile phones. The GPS accuracy is a good question. Uh, the mobile phones and normal car navigators, they do maybe five to 10 meters. That's the normal free to use GPS. But in addition to that, we have those so-called differential GPS, which takes you to maybe one meter or something. And then we have the special, really, really special RTK positioning, which has some maybe two centimeters or something, the accuracy. The problem with DGPS and the RTK positioning is that they need infrastructure on the earth, on the ground. So they are not global positioning. They are helping the global positioning on a local areas. For, for example, in, in Western countries, we do have DGPS coverage. And we also, in Finland at least, we have very good RTK coverage. But it's not available like everywhere. Like the GPS is available everywhere. Uh, another issue with GPS is that it often needs, at least for the best accuracy, it needs the clear view to the sky. For example, here indoors, your positioning probably works on your phone, but it's not very good. And if you're driving in, a, in the cities with tall buildings around you, the buildings may block the best accuracy of the positioning. It's quite clear to understand that if you're driving this lane and the positioning doesn't know which lane you are going, you may be on this lane or you may be on that lane, you can't do decisions on the lanes according to GPS, so you need something else in addition. I have one demo here. Uh, this one is taken at Finnish Lapland, Muonio. Uh, it's uh, by a company called Sensible4. They are also coming to Breakpoint, just in case you're interested. Uh, this, at the right-hand side, we have the LiDAR image. image. It's, you, you understand it when, it when I hit the play, but it basically creates a dots of three, uh, a 3D world of dots. The, the green path shows the where the car has been driving. The red spots show what the car considers as an obstacle. The car should not hit it. The yellow is something, maybe an obstacle. The car is not sure if it's an obstacle. And then the rest is just in, uh, around the environment. There's buildings and some trees. Here we have the visible light uh, camera, and below it we have the thermal image camera. So it's quite clear to understand how this, how this goes. Let's see. Okay, so, well, it's quite understandable that there's a human, so probably we shouldn't hit it. Uh, he's very clearly visible in thermal imaging. The image would be the same during the day and during the night. Now it's a daylight 
um, daylight, so it's the human is also visible in daylight camera. But in, in real pitch darkness, we couldn't see anything out of the person. And then you probably could quite clearly understand the environment from the LIDAR 3D uh, model. That's how it works. That's like one way of doing it. Okay, this is another version of a car. This is from Tampere Hervanta. It's a VTT, the Finnish, I don't know if it's any more state-owned research center. This is the front of Volkswagen Touareg uh, with some sensors. So if we go through this, this is uh, normal daylight lights. They emit normal visible light. Below we have IR area, infrared uh, lights. So they emit the infrared light which we can't see with our eyes. But this piece over here which has two lenses is the IR camera. So it's uh, it's the early version of night vision. You, you, there's there's a IR light and then there's the camera sensible to that and well we can see it in darkness with that. We have three LIDARs, so this one here, one here, and third one is showing over there. They are the laser scanners made by German SICK, S-I-C-K, or SICK name, I would say. And this one here is a radar, so the black box over here. That's, that's all. So, so that's, that's like one way of doing an autonomous car, which is capable uh, riding, uh, driving on the well, any Finnish road, day and day and night, winter and summer. This is uh, Audi A8, the one of the most equipped uh, car on the market. Uh, there's you probably don't see the text uh, from the back seat, but what's what's the point here is that it has multiple radars. Usually modern well-equipped car has one radar. It's at the front and it measures the distance to the car in front and, and it does, what it does is the uh, uh, cruise control, adaptive cruise control. But this vehicle has, in addition, it has radars, uh, two at the back and two at the front. They are mid-range radars. Then it has the normal ultrasound, which is normal to any car. Uh, it has the normal front camera, daylight camera, which is quite normal nowadays. And first, in any production car, it has the laser scanner at the front of the car. So it has more sensors than basically any, any car you know, of the current market. But personally, I haven't had a chance to drive it yet. So I don't know the actual performance of the car, but at least looking at the sensors, it should have quite good uh, picture of, of surroundings, then it's only up to the, the actual computing power and the software and the AI, how well it actually performs with, with these sensors. Also the Audi A6 and A7 have been introduced using the same sensor set, or pretty much the same sensor set. So about the future developments of the sensors, uh, the LIDAR is apparently the thing with, with, with uh, autonomous vehicles. It seems to be on top of every single autonomous car prototype. Uh, may, you may have seven of them or just one of them, I don't, but anyway, you, you are gonna have a LIDAR on top of, cam on, of, on top of the autonomous car. Uh, <coughs> the, the LIDARs currently have rotating mirrors, but development is going to solid state where we do the laser scanning without any moving parts, so which of course aims to lower cost, smaller size and better durability. We are also going to get more range and resolution to uh, laser scanners, especially using the 1550 uh, nanometer wavelength. The point with new wavelength is that we can put more power to the laser. The usual fre uh, frequencies and wavelengths do harm human eye, but that uh, wavelength doesn't. So the research is going to 70 watts lasers, which is very, very high power lasers. And they can uh, punch through the 
the rain and the fog much better than the previous models. So lasers are going to like all weather performance. Of course, they perform better in bright, clear sky, but they do also somewhat good job in the future with in, in rain and water. Radars are moving from 24 gigahertz to 77 gigahertz, and when you raise the frequency, you make you can make smaller antennas, you can bring more power, we can bring higher bandwidth, and which leads to smaller size and better accuracy with the radars. So maybe in the future, our radars are getting more and better resolution than the current radar models. If if we if we look the big picture. Uh, we, we see that there are drawbacks in, in every single sensor tech. So there is not like one sensor to rule them all. Autonomous cars, autonomous vessels are always a sensor fusion cases. When we combine information from one or two or three sensors to create the actual picture of the surroundings of the vessel or the car. And still the really long distance sensing, 200, maybe 300 meters above that, that's, that's the hard one because currently we don't seem to have a really good sensor looking more than that. In the daylight, the cameras are fine if the weather permits, but for the night, it's, it's hard. And you can imagine the highway speeds if you're traveling 120 kilometers for an hour, the 200 meters is actually going quite fast. So you need to make decisions about, about stopping the car or something like that quite soon if you only see to 200 meters. <clears throat> and one, one unfortunate fact with sensors for autonomous cars is the price. They are expensive. They may, currently they may add to 100,000 euros or something to one single vehicle. So it's quite clear that we, don't, we are not going to get autonomous privately owned regular Joe cars anytime soon, but the autonomous technology will go to, to big commercial vessels where we can justify the heavy price of, of the autonomous technology. Thank you. That was all for now. Uh, there's my blog, autovauhotus.fi slash oikosolku. It's in Finnish, but, well, most of you probably understand it. Uh, do you have any questions for now about sensors? Thank you. You talked quite much about the sensors on the vehicles, on the moving vehicles, but yeah. what about the sensors which are not moving, for example, on the roads? I recently read a very, very interesting article, so the idea was like exactly like you're saying, that that's not only one type of sensors, there are various types of sensors working together, making a very complex system and delivering actually the autonomous experience. But yeah. In addition to that, it seems that it's not only cars who do the sensing. It's also the roads, the traffic lights, yeah. the people, the pedestrian uh, walks, and a lot of a lot of things in the environment. They also should have some sensors. Yeah, yeah. That's. I would I would agree that to create actually working autonomous vehicle and ecosystem around it, especially for urban areas, uh, we we would need sensors on the cars too. Uh, no, <laughs> I mean on the roads too, and well, the fixed uh, static infrastructure. The problem with that is, of course, that the cost, if you want to fill a country with sensors, it's going to cost like huge amounts of money. And then the, another problem is the data relay from the sensors to the car fast enough, like way, way faster than anything we have right now. So that's an issue. So right now, the manufacturers, they seem to go their target seems to be like individual, individually working autonomous car without the support of the infrastructure. And well, it's, you can question that. I, I don't necessarily agree that it's easy or even possible to do without the infrastructure support. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, well, yeah. With, with, the, with the Uber, Uber car, the headline said that they have moved from seven sensors to one LIDAR. But it didn't say anything about other sensors, about thermal imaging or, or any, other, any other method of, of sensing. I'm pretty confident that 
the LIDAR only will not work. They, they, they do need thermal imaging, normal imaging radars and stuff like that. Have La you observed the video? Have you seen the video? Yeah. Yes. She came just like that? Yeah, she came so just like that. Like what is the speed and even if the seven sensors are there, what could be the speed? Yeah, the but I still consider, I, yeah, I've seen the video, but I still consider that kind of the easy version because she didn't run. She walked she very, walking. yeah, she was walking, but very slowly. And it, it was dark, yes, but there wasn't fog or rain or anything like that. At least I don't remember seeing anything like, anything like that. So I think it should have been, they should have avoided that. It, it sh uh, excuse me? Thermal imaging would have done the trick if they look at the sides of the road yes. instead of just directly to the front. Yeah. But in VTT, where the thermal image positioning will be there in this car, the one which you are showing the VTT? The thermal imaging. Yeah. This one. This one. To my understanding, this thing doesn't have thermal imaging, but it, does the IR, it has the IR cameras. And to my understanding, if you emit IR light, the, uh, the living creatures are reflected differently compared to the rest of the, well, the nature behind it. The other car, the, the Sensible 4 car, it, it has the thermal imaging with, with the laser. Uh, there. Yeah, I think the um, expensive technology somehow justifies with the kind of, you know, autonomous ships type of environments, but um, how does the complexity changes between like, you know, on the sea and on the on the road? Like, you know, at size and, um, um, I mean, you probably know more. Yeah, you, you mean the difference between the sea vessels and sea the road vessels? Sea vessels and the, yeah, yeah. something on For the road. Well, at, at Reactor, we've been working on the autonomous vessels, and from our perspective, looking at the vessels, we, we are considering that there's a big difference is that our, our, uh, the route we are navigating is really simple. So when our ferry is at the one end of the road or the trip, it basically sees the destination all the time. If you think about the car, it, may, it has to be able to drive hundreds of kilometers like all, in all sorts of conditions autonomously. But our vessel basically is capable of seeing the destination all the time. So all it has to do is to drive to that direction and just avoid anything that comes to the way. Uh, another problem with boats is that when you're driving, you can consider the, the, the road is being static all the time. But if you're riding a vessel, on a river, you may need to consider that the water is actually moving where you are ride, driving your your vessel. So we need you need you, that's like one one round more of of like mathematics. And and I also understood, or not exactly sure, but um, there may be as well uh, some regulation on the sea that, uh, that it's, yeah. it's it's not the regulation always. currently. But well, we, we can in Finland we have an area for for testing autonomous vessels on a, on a sea, and in Finland we also have quite liberal uh, legislation for autonomous cars. Uh, for example, the, the video I showed is taken in in Lapland. It's it's a public road where they've been driving it. Uh, also at Vanta and Espoo they've been driving autonomous cars, and also at Jatkasari last summer at, at Helsinki. So so we have we have those things on the roads. And, but but still, they are like they are testing. It's it's not there like in the wild, like open and public yet. Yeah. Thanks. Hello, and thanks for the talk. Uh, I would like to ask first of all, um, in commercial technology that is currently deployed, uh, what happens to the data that is gathered? Data. Yeah. When the car is driving and it gathers data. Well, if, if you mean technical, technically, I mean, is uh, are the data stored somewhere? Are they up? Well, the amount of data is so huge, and the uplink from the car to the network is so narrow that basically you can't store everything. But what they do is that they teach the neural networks with that material. So basically, when the car drives around. Uh, 
at least for the first, it pr probably has a human driver. For example, the Tesla Model S and X, what they do right now is that they have, of course, human drivers at the car. Every single Tesla has a human driver, but they also do have the GPUs and the cameras. So while people are ri driving around their Teslas, they teach basically the neural network, but they don't upload everything. They don't upload every video, every everything, but they do the math at the car and then th they take the result and send it to the Tesla servers where Tesla can make basically any car driving better. And if I can ask another question, uh, how easily hackable is this equipment? <laughs> like, <laughs> That's a really good question and quite uh, hard one. I would say it, it's too easy for now. But on the other hand, of course, these manufacturers, they don't open their, their, their source codes or anything. But it, it is possible to, to spoof uh, lasers, radars, ultrasounds, all this. Of course, it's quite difficult. It requires some very special hardware, but it's doable. And, and uh, ev ev I guess everybody has seen, seen the joke when, when you can take an autonomous car and you just draw a white line ac around the car and then the car can't move anymore because because it's surrounded by white lines so it which is not it's not allowed to cross it so that's probably the simplest version but 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 of course there are more complex versions too i that's actually a good question i'm i'm a bit concerned about that On the microphone. Uh, just firstly, a comment about the, the previous question. I guess they, the cars actually themselves record the last 10 minutes of data or something like oh, yeah, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, probably something like that, so like that, the airplanes. So that you can yeah. get those videos of accidents and things. Yeah. But, um, uh, but the question was really the cost of the sensors, like the fabulous cost of like 100,000 for, for, for all the sensors. Is, is it the LiDAR sensor that is actually the, the real meat here? Yeah, the LiDAR is, is the expensive thing. and you basically need many of them. For example, this car has three. And this car is, it has sensors only at the front. So the only thing it can do is drive a straight road. It, it, it doesn't see backwards or right or left. So it's not autonomous in sense of full autonomous. It's a, it's a testing car. They test the things with that. And for the testing purposes, they only have the front facing sensors. Basically, what you need is multiple leaders. And they are expensive, yes. Tens of thousands of uh, yeah, depending on the sensor. If you have if those, the more small Velodyne I showed is probably way cheaper, but it's not that accurate and it doesn't see that far away. But there is a lot of research and development happening on lasers right now, a lot. So they are going to get cheaper and better all the time, fast. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. So when do you see um, autonomous cars actually being around? If you consider autonomous car as something that drives 90 to 95 percent, almost all conditions, and is, in, is remotely controlled by a human being, uh, that will happen in, in, maybe, in maybe two or three years. In, in some geo-fenced small areas which are well mapped. Uh, if you consider autonomous car as a car that can travel in any condition, in any weather, in any road where a human being could drive, that will take maybe 20 years.